Yes. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm a creative. We don't get people to reach for the chest. who just want to supply with supply them something. The way you can actually make all these things work. But here in Nigeria, it's difficult to actually sell our program to stations. You, you, you can't let one thing suffer from the other. Welcome, this is a chat to the professional. We are still doing our 10th anniversary special. And still in Washington DC today, we are going to be having another core Nigerian professional at the World Bank. And we are talking about the Chief Diversity Officer, um, Julie Oyegun, uh, homebred, but today she makes her mark at the World Bank. Uh, the interview segment comes up after a usual break. Please do not go anywhere. We'll be back. Alright, viewers, you're still watching a chat with a professional issue that has been designed to x ray the activities of professional individuals and corporate bodies. Uh, like I did mention to you in my introduction, today we have another Nigerian. Um, a core professional. Uh, he, she's been with the World Bank for a very long time. Uh, we are talking about Julie Oyegun, who is the Chief Diversity Officer at the World Bank Group. Uh, Ma'am, you're welcome to the show. Thank you very much. All right. Now, as a Nigerian in Washington, D.C., to start with, what does it feel like walking across the streets of Washington um, and you're asked where you come from and then you say you're a Nigerian? How does it feel? I suppose I've been here so long now that I don't... It's, it's almost unconscious, you know, you don't okay. think... And, you know, you, when you work in the World Bank, you're working with people from 187 nationalities anyway. Uh, and so there's nothing unusual about being a Nigerian okay. in the World Bank. So. And I, I think also Washington, D.C. is extremely cosmopolitan. Okay. Uh, it's probably the most cosmopolitan part of the U.S. And yeah. so you're constantly bumping into people okay. uh, who come from different places. And I'm professionally curious okay. about people from other places. Good. The chief diversity officer, that's the business I'm in. Yes. So it's par for the course. It's good to meet people from other places. Good. And you obviously had your training in Nigeria. Some of it. Some of it. Good. How has the training you got in Nigeria impacted in what you do in Washington, D.C.? Well. There's, there's formal training and there's tacit training. Okay. And um, uh, the first job I did in Nigeria, uh, I worked for Senator Dafinone years and years ago, about, gosh, 30, more than 30 years ago, okay. uh, on indigenization. I see. And um, that was my first introduction to diversity issues. Yeah. Um, if, if you recall, I don't know if you're old enough to remember, uh, what the indigenization decree did in yeah. the early you know, uh, mid-70s. Yeah. Uh, basically the intent was to transfer economic power to indigenous Nigerians yeah. from foreigners just as we had gained political power yeah. you know, a decade earlier. And so um, I was very privileged to be trained on the job um, to understand the nuances of difference and diversity and uh, the power of who owns what, yeah. you know, who can have access and uh, control. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, in addition to being a Nigerian trained lawyer, I have very practical training good. in what I do for a living from Nigeria. That's good. Well, um, when you left Nigeria, the educational system was still compact. Um, I, I remember um, up till the 80s, I had some Germans graduating from the University of Nigeria. That's true. I attended one of the graduation ceremonies, and I had Germans in gra graduating there. Today, I think it's a different ball game. What do you think we've gotten wrong? Why have we gotten to this state of uh, decay in our educational system? Well, assuming that the system is in decay, 
Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I'm fully aware that it's not what, you know, you, of course, when you get to my age, yeah. um, you look back and you say, back in the day. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so let's register that caveat first. Yes. But I have to say that one of the reasons I left Nigeria um, in the 80s was because it was very clear that my children wouldn't get the quality of education that I was able to take for granted. I mean, yeah. my husband did his first degree in Nigeria. I did my first degree in Nigeria. And um, gosh, when my first daughter uh, was going into the University of Lagos, and I had been to the University of Lagos, so for me yeah. this was big nostalgia. You know, my daughter was going to the University of Lagos. And I remember a wrangle between my husband and I. No, she should go to UI. I went yeah. to UI. So it was a very amicable wrangle, but we, you know, we each had this faith yes. in, in the system. system. And um, I was very disappointed. And okay. um, the second one went into Ife, and the third one uh, was, was on the verge. In fact, she had actually registered at Unilag when we decided, you know what, this isn't working. This is not the kind of education that we received and that we had anticipated for our children. Okay. Uh, you want to believe as, as a parent that um, with each generation there is progress, yep. that your children do better than you've been able to do, that they're able to access a superior quality uh, of education in this case yes. um, than you were able to take for granted. I certainly um, received a better education than my, than my parents okay. who had to go to the UK for higher education. Yeah. So to be able to stay in Nigeria and receive a world-class education at the time in the 70s, um, we took it for granted. And I think we also assumed that our children, the next generation, would be able to do the same thing. And it became patently and patent, and, and I think pa painfully obvious yeah. that that would not be the case for our children. And that's when we decided to leave the country. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, given this scenario, what do you think could be done to salvage the situation? Well, you know, it's, it's, there's always a case of going back to basics. I mean, what is education meant to do? And I think in a country that is um, concerned with the quality of its democratization, um, that obviously is one thing, one goal, one objective that education should deliver. All right? um, and I think that I have a favorite, um, if any of my friends or people that I have worked with hear this, um, the quality of democratization, I think, is key yeah. um, to what education should, should deliver. Yes. It ought to deliver citizens. Yeah. It ought to deliver a quality of citizenship that can form the basis of the democracy that we're seeking. I think democracy, I think we all know by now, yeah. that it's not an event, and it's not a set of institutions, it's actually a process of development and um, education should deliver very actively okay. to that. Thank you very much. At this point we must take a break. Uh, this You are still watching a chat with a professional and uh, here with me in Washington DC is Julie Oyegun who is the Chief Diversity Officer at the World Bank. Please don't go away, we'll be back. Recently I had a chat with the chairman of the Broadcasting Organization of Nigeria and I also raised that issue with him. Um, why do we have to leave the private organizations to fend for everything that they do in broadcasting? For instance, in other climes, TV and radio licenses are collected and these in turn are used to support the, private, uh, the privately owned stations. But we have a totally different scenario here because even the licenses, we do not know where it goes to. The um, public stations get funding from government, yet the private stations offer some sort of social responsibility because, for instance, um, there couldn't be anything that is of national interest and you say because the government is not paying you, you are not going to carry the news. Uh, meanwhile, you're running on gen, you're paying staff, to get all that uh, passed across. Thank you very much, Martin. In fact, you have summarized it. Um, to survive in this environment uh, takes a lot, not only for broadcasters, yes. uh, for businessmen um, in, in, in different dimensions. Yeah. Uh, it, but for us in broadcasting, it comes with a price. Okay. Uh, because 
um, most business executives, when they sit down with a uh, corporate communications mm -hmm. uh, experts and managers and they want to take decisions on, on budget reduction. Mm -hmm. One of the areas they look at is, oh, publicity, do you really need to spend that much? Um, you can as well do ex expand your uh, friendship and talk to your friends in, yeah. in the media, in radio and TV, mm -hmm. and they should be able to do it free for you. Or they are talking of outright reduction. That's even when yeah. they want to do anything. And again, the issue of... Um, the license fees that you talk about is another yeah. issue. Okay. And in different climes, in different countries, there are uh, various templates yeah. that are used. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in some, the public broadcasters, whether it's federal or state, are allowed to have few advertisements. Yeah. And they, they take it as a surcharge, maybe on the top of the hour, yeah. during the news, but well, not around the clock. Yes. Well, here is, is a mix of all sorts in this yeah. part of the world. And because some get funding, particularly, like you rightly said, the public broadcasters, we have had to be as ingenious as you can imagine to yeah. stay alive and afloat. And then you want to ask yourself, how many private broadcasters are really doing well? Yeah. How many of them are still alive? Some go through pains, some go through some form of epilepsy. One minute yeah. you are alive, another minute you are, you are as good as dead. So it's, it's really tough. Um, I think the fact that we are standing on our feet is, yes. um, is due to the mercy of the Lord. And, mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that uh, we've also had, over time, very dedicated staff, yeah. those who believe that, who believe in the dream and the vision. Okay. If I have to be futuristic, if I have to look uh, with, the, with, the, with the power of clairvoyance, yeah. we have to be honest to ourselves, that uh, five, ten years down the line, uh, how many stations will still be where they are yeah. if we do not allow for a level playing field, mm -hmm. if we do not create an enabling environment for private broadcasters yeah. to uh, thrive, or private broadcasting to thrive, in, yeah. in terms of sourcing of commercials, in terms of getting funding from even government institutions itself, from even government, yeah. in, in some countries, the BBC, get some form of funding from British government. Yeah. And uh, the CNN, even the American the legislature sometimes yes. will approve of special grants for the BBC, especially when, when America feels that its sovereignty is threatened yes. or the American state is at war mm -hmm. and then they want to oil some propaganda machine. So I, I do believe that uh, these are areas that we should look at uh, to encourage, because wh whether public or private broadcasters, we are all employing Nigerians, course, we are creating employment opportunities for yes. thousands and thousands of graduates who leave school mm -hmm. and do not get jobs or do not find places yeah. to earn sustenance or a means of, means of livelihood. Mm -hmm. Welcome back. You're still watching a chat to the professional. Before we went on break, we were discussing the educational development of our great country, Nigeria. And with me here remains Judy Oyegun, who is the Chief Diversity Officer at the World Bank. And so, man, before we went on break, we were talking about, you know, what went wrong, what we, 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 we did wrong that um, got us into the level of decay we are into. Could, could you elaborate on that? I think my experience of the decay um, particularly with regard to our children. Um, um, and, and I had seen it with my brothers uh, who went to university after me. Kids were just never in school. I mean, universities were closed more than they were open. It was yeah. either student strikes or lecturer strikes. I mean, yeah. just they were never in school. It was yeah. taking seven years to complete a three-year degree. Yeah. 